Hello and welcome to Technology Today. I'm Susan Houghton and our topic for today's show focuses on one of the many issues that have surfaced since September 11th, how to stop terrorists. Now if you've watched some of our previous shows, you've seen a number of exciting new technologies that are currently being presented to the federal government for possible development. And now, here is one of the de technologies that we've developed for the state of California, and specifically for the California Highway Patrol, among other agencies. Here to talk about this exciting new technology is Ron Cochran. He's Chief Executive Officer at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And Dave McCallum, who is Director of the Lab's Center for Complex Distributed Systems. Gentlemen, welcome. Dave, that's quite a title. You're in charge of really one of our engineering centers, but you also got a fancy title to boot. Yeah, it's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you for coming on our show today. This is called the truck stopping device, among other names, but it's, it's an exciting new technology we developed for the state of California, for the California Energy Commission, for the California Highway Patrol. And how did we think of this, Ron? What made us say, let's go do this? Okay. Well, thank you, Susan. Well, the 9-11 changed many things. For the first time, we had terrorists bringing the battle to us, and we had terrorists who were willing to die in the attempt, very willing to do so. And so that caused us to go back and look at a lot of things that have been identified, perhaps, as concerns, but not really the kind of uh, thing that could lead to an attack like we saw in New York City. The trucks is one of those. It's been known for some time that a truck loaded with fuel has about the same explosive potential as the aircraft that hit the World Trade Center. Right, so, so we just don't need to worry about the airplanes, but just about any mode of transportation might be something that we want to focus on. Where a lot of fuel is involved. And there have been trucks that have been run away uh, mm -hmm. that we've seen in the news. There was also, about a year ago, a truck that actually crashed into the state of California Capitol. That's correct. Now, luckily, what, did that have fuel on that truck? No, that actually was a milk truck, but as you'll hear a little later, it caused $24 million in damage due to the fuel that was on, you know, associated was just with the truck. There. Just in there, right. But had it been a fuel truck, it just imagine. Been, right. and, and the problem that we've had to date, or that the California Highway Patrol has had to date, is you've got a truck, a huge truck, how do you stop it when you know it's out of control? So how does this work, Dave? Well, the basic underlying concept is quite simple. Essentially, every truck that's on the road has safety features that allow the truck to come to a halt if the braking system fails. The brakes are automatically engaged. And really the technology that we've implemented is essentially tapping into that existing system. So it's very simple. Uh, we're just triggering the system that's already there. And by triggering the system, as we're going to see in a video later, it can occur a number of ways. It can occur, I think there's, you can actually ram it or you can shoot it or lots of different options for the highway patrol to be able to use this. That's correct. We can have an impact activated device where a, a officer's vehicle would come up and bang the truck and actually set the brakes on. We're currently working on a radio control device where you could actually push a button remotely and engage the truck's braking system. So there's a whole span of different ways you could activate that system. Okay, now Ron, so, so there was an idea and somebody mm -hmm. came to our laboratory. How did we get involved? Uh, we got involved because we were contacted by the governor who said, uh, many things have happened since 9-11. I'm going to need some help from a technology standpoint and working on technologies to help prevent some of these. Uh, the truck stopping thing in particular was one that was of great concern because it's been on TV and other places, but trucks are very difficult to stop. Sometimes you have to chase trucks for hours before they can stop. There was a one notable one about uh, six months ago in Texas, a lumber truck that. that would chase for hours. Uh, subsequently in California, there was one that went from Sacramento to Redding before they could stop it because normal um, equipment that a highway patrol person might have, namely their vehicle and their weapon, simply won't stop those big trucks. Right. So it took another approach. Uh, we had a very clever uh, in retired engineer who actually came to us with an idea that said, I know about the braking systems, and gee, maybe this is a way to tackle this problem. And that's where Dave took over. So Dave Center partnered with this man who developed the idea and said, mm -hmm. okay, we can make two and two happen, and, right. and here's, here's a prototype. Well, why don't we go ahead now and take a look at this video. It's a short video we're going to show you, and it actually illustrates how this truck stopping device works uh, with actual trucks and CHP cars. So let's take a look at that now. In late 2001, the governor of California established a task force on the safe delivery of fuels. Headed by the California Highway Patrol, the group was to develop ways to stop a stolen or hijacked big rig truck 
using only the standard police car and firearms available to every peace officer. Break, break. This need arose from concern that a fuel truck could potentially be used in a terrorist bombing since it contains explosive potential roughly equivalent to a jetliner. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory has successfully developed a simple mechanical device that would allow law enforcement officers to stop a tractor trailer rig on demand. This resulted from collaboration of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory engineers, the California Highway Patrol, fuel and trucking industries, and organized labor. In addition, working closely with the California Highway Patrol, an alternate immediate solution has been developed based on law enforcement officers disabling big rigs by shooting standard firearms at critical soft spots. Both the mechanical impact device and the weapon techniques have recently been successfully field tested at the National Nuclear Security Administration's Nevada test site. It's a more roadworthy device than something which could actually go down the road. So we replaced that with an actual, looks like a push bumper. It sure does. It's like a normal bumper. Yeah. And, and uh, it's not there anymore. So it's more of a protection device. If you look in the mirror here, what you'll see is when you push up on this, it goes up and compresses two cylinders that have uh, springs in them, rotates that bar that you see across there, punches that box, and that box has two ratchets in it. When you hit the first ratchet, it sets up for the second Hello? punch. You punch it again, and it closes the valve, closes the valve one way, and vents the air the other way. Now, you may be aware of some of the work that we've done in the sensor area and trying to find ways to very rapidly detect uh, nuclear, chemical, biological threats. And that's going on right now in Salt Lake City and other places. We uh, also have been encouraged by General Gordon to use our capabilities in whatever way we can to try to help counter terrorism threats. And so after September 11th, the governor of California, Governor Gray Davis, got in contact with us and asked us to work with the state to try to identify potential threats and to counter those threats. We started analyzing potential threats and we found a few. One of the first things we found was that for certain situations, bridges are a very easy target. So we identified those, analyzed those, and governors take steps to eliminate that potential threat. One of the other things that's a serious potential threat is trucks loaded with fuel, gasoline trucks. Uh, if you compare the explosive potential for those trucks with that of a fully loaded aircraft, they're comparable. So you can do a great deal of damage to those trucks if you think about how many of them are going around. And <clears throat> trucks turn out to be very difficult to stop. Just one year ago in California, we had the unfortunate experience of a person taking an 80,000 pound truck and running it into our capital. And so what happened, it was loaded with condensed milk, but it caught on fire and did $24 million damage. All the extra intelligence, in fact, it had gasoline or any kind of a hazardous chemical on it, it would have destroyed the state capital. But there is no technique that's really working to foolproof right now to stop a large truck. Well, Bill Wattenberg brought the concept forward to the laboratory, and we looked at that and built a very quick prototype of that and tested it at Alameda. Once that was successful, it took us about three months to bring that into a fruition and build a device which would actually be usable on trucks on the highway. So it was about a three-month project. If we were able to stop just one of these trucks, uh, just the money alone being saved on the truck not being destroyed, much less someone dying or a building being destroyed, the investment has really been uh, minuscule to say the very least. But he said the two things that counted. He said, give us something that the police officer can use with the tools he's got. Well, what has he got? He's got his car, he's got his weapon. And do it so he doesn't risk his life. That's what clicked. So let me show you how it works.
reset. Hit, reset. Hit, reset. Hit, reset. One shot, one kill. Good job, dude. This project shows how technology can address an immediate and critical homeland security problem. The California Highway Patrol will brief the governor's task force on safe delivery of fuels on the results of these experiments very soon. The task force will then have the technical information necessary to develop policies, procedures, and legislative initiatives for homeland security transportation issues. So what you've seen is a demonstration, a video demonstration of some of the field trials that we did on this truck stopping device. And of course, Ron, we saw uh, Tom Rich, who is the director of Homeland Security there. And what did he think of this exciting new technology? He thought it was marvelous. It's always sort of fun to talk about what was behind the, the camera, so to speak. And we actually took this test out to Nevada. Senator Harry Reid, he's one of the senior people in the Senate is setting up a center for countering terrorism at the Nevada test site. And so we were able to go there and do some things that we couldn't easily do here. We've now had the chance to show this to Governor Davis, to uh, Governor Ridge, Tom Ridge, to Joe Albaugh, who's head of the Federal Inter Inter Emergency Management Agency, mm -hmm. uh, to Senator Reed, who is uh, one of the top people in the Senate, to Governor Gwen of Nevada. So we've actually managed to get a lot of people interested in this, as well as General John Gordon, who's our boss in the Department of Energy. You ask how they reacted. Their reaction was, uh, was really great. They were just dying to get in the chase car and actually chase the truck. <laughs> so they actually did that. They wanted to be the ones who actually stopped the actual truck from, uh, from going forward. They, they did that. Uh, Governor Ridge and uh, General Gordon and Senator Reed got in the chase car. Uh, the Secret Service, who actually control this thing to a very you know, small margin. They actually tell everybody where to stand and all this stuff. They were going crazy mm. because they, they had lost Governor Ridge in the chase car, and they knew they were dead if anything went wrong. Uh oh! <laughs> but they, they thoroughly enjoyed it. They came back and they said, uh, you know, this is really, really great. This is the kind of work that we need for Homeland Security. In fact, in a side conversation with me, uh, Governor Ridge said, look, you know, I had told him about identifying a number of things that we were doing for the state of California. And he said, we need to do that for the nation. We need to identify so the dirty dozen and go after those. And he was going to take that back, and he has been in communication with DOE concerning ways to use technology to try to head off some of the, the things that could become terrorist events. So it's a good example of the lab setting a standard that hopefully will be executed in a number of different venues in a number of different states. Right. And of course we saw you on there and we saw Dave on there. We also heard from the CHP head, Spike, who was talking about how good it was, and our consultant as well. Mm -hmm. 
Now, I saw four or five different types of ways that a truck can be stopped. Can you right. briefly go over those, Dave, and tell us which are the most effective? Yeah, you basically saw three different phases of an experiment there. The first phase was the impact activator device, where the CHP officer actually follows up on the vehicle, smacks the uh, truck stopping device, activates it, the truck stops. That was phase one of our testing, and that went wonderfully. It worked quite well from the get-go. Phase two, we actually played what is essentially laser tag. And we have lasers at the system that we use to practice our engagements. We put sensors on the truck, uh, laser activated weapons in the vehicle, and allowed the CHP officers to chase the vehicle, shooting at the vehicle to practice and develop the skill set necessary to shoot at critical regions on that vehicle. Okay, now let's stop there for a second. If you're shooting, and that requires a truck to obviously have a sensor on it. Correct. Could that sensor be dismantled by a terrorist? Uh, this is this part of the sensor is just for the practice, to allow them to develop the skill set. It doesn't activate anything. That's a precursor to the final stage you saw there, which is actually allowing them to shoot their weapons at soft spots on the vehicles. And that also, that technology and that methodology also works surprisingly well. Uh, I think you hear in the video one of the CHP officers call out one shot, one kill. It turns out that was their very first try at shooting at that vehicle. And on the very first uh, example try of that, they were able to stop that vehicle at cold with one shot. Wow. So that'll give a lot of flexibility to law enforcement to be able to choose which type of technique they want to do. That's correct. Not every truck will have a truck stopping device, either in the near future or even in the distant future. Some may, but every single officer has access to a firearm. And so the notion there is that's something that could be implemented near term to stop these vehicles. Okay. So, Ron, go ahead. One of their, uh, one of their practices in the past has been to try to shoot out the tires. Mm -hmm. And it's been demonstrated that this doesn't do a very good job of stopping a big truck like mm -hmm. that if you shoot out the trailer tires. So now they've got a new weapon, right. in a sense. They can shoot out the, Not uh, to mention, it, it, but when you shoot out tires, it causes kind of almost a tailspin on a truck. But yeah. if you're shooting something else, the tires are still intact, so it actually stops in a cleaner fashion. Yeah, shooting the brake system actually adds stability to the truck because you're essentially dragging a big dead weight, and you have no tendency for the truck to fishtail or slide. And so it actually results in a stopping mode that adds stability to the truck system. So it couldn't be better. Okay, so we did this out in Nevada at the test site, mm -hmm. and then now what? We're doing field trials? Uh, phase two, with the, with the oversight of the governor's task force on the safe delivery of fuels, will actually be building a number of these devices, implementing them in actual trucks on the road, and going through an extended series of field trials in the real actual environment to make sure these things work well in the real world. Will That's these be two. on new trucks or certain kinds of trucks, or how will they determine who's... They will most likely be on some new trucks that are being built right now. A subset of those trucks will be pulled out and set aside. This device will be implemented, and they'll go out on the road. Mm -hmm. And then they will determine just through random checking whether or not it works or not. What will happen is these trucks will go in their day-to-day -day activities just like they would normally. Periodically, one of those trucks will be pulled off on a remote road, and a CHP officer will try and activate the device on short notice to make sure that if called upon, they could do that in short term. Okay, and so let's say those field trials are successful, and, and what kind of time period are we talking about that we hope to have some data back? We are probably talking about six months from now in terms of the field trials. And, and then we would turn it over to um, a the, company? The next phase would be turning it over to the legislative process, because the legisl eventually these would have to be legislated on vehicles. And so the governor's task force actually has a political subcommittee that is looking into legislative action to implement these and mandate these things on certain types of vehicles. And then, Ron, of course, that's your expert area. And once that occurs, then it goes over into an actual commercialization process. That would be our intent, yes. The commercial companies who would like to take this product and develop it, uh, make it available commercially. It's a relatively inexpensive product, and that was another one of the requirements that was placed on us. I think some of the most exciting things are actually another phase, which Dave hasn't talked about yet, because we should be able to develop a uh, device you could uh, place on a truck if it comes into an area that you want to control, like around the Capitol building, for example, or mm -hmm. like on DOE sites and have it on there so that it would work while it's on site and you could remove it when it goes off site. And Dave, I think, is working on that at so this time. So almost like a, a touch base process. If you're coming in and accessing it, you immediately get this device on. And then if right. something happens to that truck while you're there, you have the ability to stop it. Yeah, we've, we refer to it as an electronic picket fence. Mm -hmm. If this device is on a truck and it crosses a certain line, the device is automatically activated. Wow, that's great. Now, Ron, this is just one good example of some of a number of technologies that we're doing for the state. Could you briefly talk about some of the other ideas that have surfaced? Sure. I, I mentioned that we've developed sort of a list. It's a, not a very long list yet, but there are other areas that were very vulnerable, uh, particularly bridges, and Dave's done a lot of work on bridges. I think that that was brought to us perhaps by Bill Wattenberg. He was also a key guy in, in the truck 
stopping device invention. And so we've looked at bridges where there were some vulnerabilities Dave can talk about. We've looked at stopping trucks. We're now looking at how to deal with shipping containers because it's, uh, California has a huge volume of shipping containers coming into various ports. It's very, very difficult to uh, examine those uh, as thoroughly as we'd like to. And a lot of people are working on that. We're trying to look at some things that are sort of beyond the mm -hmm. current technologies for looking at those because that is also a large vulnerability. Okay. Now, on all of these devices, even though they're being ideas for the state, they could have applications throughout the nation. That would be the expectation. Uh, the state has shown a particular interest. Uh, we want to work closely with the state, which we're doing. Uh, we are part of the community, and so we'd like to take these talents, which are primarily aimed at national problems, and devote them to particular state problems. They can then be uh, propagated to the rest of the country. Okay, and it was your center that did the work, not only on this, but on the, on the bridge device, as, he was as Ron was talking about. Tell us about your center at the lab and why it is unique. Well, there are actually five engineering technology centers at the laboratory. The one I happen to be responsible for, as you might know from that long name, is looking at characterizing very complex systems. And a big part of our work is developing sensors and communication technologies. And as Ron mentioned, the next phase of this project is actually to develop remotely controlled activated devices where you would sense where the truck is and basically would allow law enforcement to push a button and activate that device. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine that's a fairly complex thing to do in an urban environment where the line of sight and communication paths are difficult. And so the next stage of our project really will tie in closely to my center activities in terms of developing the next phase where we can actually automatically implement these things with remote control through radio frequency. Okay, so envision me five, ten years from now, and how do you see this kind of technology changing the world that we live in? I think it would make particularly selected sites much safer. If you have a site like the Capitol, if we could be effective in the end game of this thing, it would not allow any threatening vehicle to get up close to that facility. And one of the issues, if you ever stand out beside the road and you see a big truck roaring by, mm -hmm. I think you develop a physical intuition immediately for how difficult it is to stop a moving 80,000 pound vehicle. They're just not a good way with physical barriers or by impacting it with other vehicles to stop that. If we can utilize the brake systems on those trucks to bring them to a halt, then I think we can keep them away from critical facilities, whether it's the capital or a critical bridge or whatever. Now, I, I know that there was a lot of talk um, after September 11th of some of the terrorists perhaps, you know, doing crop dusting planes and taking flying lessons. You know, is this the kind of thing that people forget about? Because an airplane is so vis visual, you think of it crashing into the World Trade Center, yet there are far more trucks on the road, far more of a greater threat just by people taking over the trucks. Right. Well, I think in the whole terrorism realm, we have to very carefully think ahead because there's not a big past experience base. What, what happened at the World Trade Center is obviously something that had never happened before. And so it wasn't in people's consciousness. So I think for trucks, for airplanes, for transportation, we always have to be thinking ahead about what could happen and what might happen and therefore be prepared rather than reacting to something after it has occurred. Okay. Ron, briefly talk about how the laboratory has certainly it's increased its involvement in the war and terrorism since September 11th. I know that we, a lot of people realize that we do a lot of work in stockpile stewardship, but our really, our terrorism role in fighting terrorism has increased significantly. Yes, it has, Susan. Uh, we actually have been involved in, for a long time in doing things like supporting arms control treaties that that kind of thing where it's important to be able to have technologies which will help you understand what's actually happening at various locations. And you can take those technologies and develop sensors which will help our first responders understand what they're being exposed to uh, if you have a chemical weapons or biological weapons attack. That's the stuff that we've been doing for, for many years now. Mm -hmm. But we're starting to extend it over into what I would call newly realized threats. Mm -hmm. Threats have always been there. But September 11th and the, the terrorists uh, that we're now facing changed all that. So we've got to keep looking ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, what we, uh, whether it's in computer networking, uh, computer security, whether it's in chemical, uh, biological, or things like stopping trucks and, brid and, re and making bridges resistant to attack, or uh, interrogating shipping containers, you've got to stay one step ahead. So the lab is really looking at that big picture. We're not yes. only looking at computer security and looking at, at nuclear and sensors for chemical and biological, but we're also looking at what might be perceived as just a truck and the right. simple devices that can make a difference in our everyday life. And, and again, the key thing is uh, thinking one step ahead because you've got to anticipate what the problem might be next year and be working on that now to, to head it off to make sure it doesn't become a real problem. And so a good example of that now is what we're doing with the port research and how to, how to make sure that containers actually contain what they say they're going to contain. Right. Okay. 
Where are we briefly on that idea? That idea is one that there are technologies which will be which can catch most things right now, and they are being uh, deployed at present, and of course there's always the physical examination. What we want to do is to see whether we can take some really far out technologies and take it a step beyond what's currently possible so okay. that you can very quickly do a full interrogation to look for uh, nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, um, any of those kind of products, high explosives, and with a high degree of certainty be able to, to catch those. Okay. Now this truck stopping device, uh, we're going to do a six month trial and then hopefully get some legislation in the state to get going and then turn it over to a process, what, three years till we see it on the streets? Well, we would certainly hope it wouldn't be that long. The intent when this project started was to go as fast as we possibly could. And as a matter of fact, between cooperation between the laboratory and the state, we did this project in three months. And that shows you the urgency. Absolutely. That's typical, a, a project of this sort typically takes a year. And so I think you, that just gives you an indication of the urgency and the concern about this at the state level. So we would be disappointed if it took three years to get this into practice. And so we're pushing very hard uh, to get something we hope into practice on a year time frame. I think you'll see a phased approach. There are uh, situations where they can be controlled, for example, on Department of Energy sites. And so you might see something going in place there uh, as fast as possible, which might be a few months. There are then, within the state of California, the governor can do certain things to make trucks which stay within the state mm -hmm. adopt these approaches. Nationally, it's going to take a little longer just because of so many uh, different entities involved. And once we start that legislation process, we'll be off to another idea, and hopefully right. your center will be involved. Okay. Well, gentlemen, that's about all the time we have left today, so thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. And, of course, thank you for joining us on this edition of Technology Today. As always, if you have any comments or suggestions for future shows, we'd love to hear from you. Please write to us at Technology Today. P.O. Box 808, L Code 797, Livermore, California, 94551. You can also email us at pal at llnl.gov. Thanks for joining us. I'm Susan Houghton. We'll see you next week on Technology Today.